You know how old people have loads of stories to tell? You know, like, Back in my day, the only time people got cancelled is when they did something actually illegal. Some talk about the war, or maybe some adventure in some faraway land. They claim to have seen it all. But I have never known a man with so many stories in and around the entertainment industry, making one of the longest careers that I know. This guy has definitely seen it all. This is the story of Norman Lloyd. Norman Lloyd was born Norman Nathan Perlmutter on the 8th of November 1914 in Jersey City of New Jersey into a Jewish family. His dad was an accountant and salesman while his mum was a bookkeeper. His mum had a long interest in theatre and took Norman to singing and dancing lessons. At age 9, Norman was a child performer for vaudeville benefits and women's clubs, his start in entertainment. He graduated high school at 15 and was studying to become a lawyer in New York University. However, he left at the end of his sophomore year following how badly the Great Depression affected everyone. At age 17, Norman became the youngest apprentice under the direction of May Sarton at Eva Lagalien's Civic Repertory Theatre in New York City and later in Sarton's Apprentice Theatre in New Hampshire. The apprentices there performed 10 modern European plays in New York and Boston. Members of Harvard Dramatic Club saw Norman's performance and offered him the lead role in a play directed by Joseph Losey, which would eventually become Gods of the Lightning. When Sarton was forced to give up her company, Losey suggested auditioning for Andre Obey's Noah. This would be Norman's first show on Broadway. Norman would be part of social theatre in the 1930s. Next, he starred in Michael Blankfoot's The Crime directed by influential Broadway and Hollywood director Elia Kazan, the same person who would later direct East of Eden, one of James Dean's breakthrough roles. It was on this production he also met Peggy Craven, who would later become his wife. Losey brought Norman onto the Federal Theatre Project, which Norman would later call one of the greatest theatres of all time. He performed in three plays, Triple A Plowed Under, Injunction Granted, and Power, all in the theatrical format of Living Newspaper, for those who don't know, Living Newspaper is a format that presents factual information on current events to a popular audience. The plays themselves were social oriented, so the audience related greatly to what was presented. But the most important thing to note here is that also in the company was Orson Welles and John Hausman. This is where things get interesting. When Welles and Hausman left the Federal Theatre Project, they went on to establish their own company called Mercury Theatre. Norman was invited to join, which he accepted making him one of the original members in the company. While in Mercury Theatre, he performed in Wells' adaptation of Julius Caesar and The Shoemaker's Holiday. I know at the start I said he was brought up in a Jewish family like it has some significant importance. When Norman was asked if his Jewish faith affected his career, he recounts a moment during his performance in Caesar. But keep in mind, this was in 1937 and Hitler was in power. Norman plays Sinner the Poet, in the play, he's killed because he simply shares the name to one of the conspirators against Caesar. The modern adaptation of the play has him killed by a secret police force. It's a scene which parallels what Nazis were doing to Jews at the time. Norman had poems in his costume and Orson told the others to hit him with him. As everyone surrounded him, beating him with poems, Norman improvised one line. He screams, the poet, and then he dies. In his words, Norman called it an extraordinary scene that gripped the audience in a way that the show stopped for about three minutes. The audience stopped it with an applause. It showed the audience what fascism really was. Rather than an intellectual approach, you saw a physical one. Now, when it comes to anti-Semitism, it's not mentioned, unless I've missed something. In the summer of 1939, Norman was invited to join Wells and other Mercury Theatre members for RKO's first film, Heart of Darkness. However, the film never went into production because of budget restraints. Orson asked the actors to stay a few more weeks as he had another film project. However, Norman took some really bad advice and left. Unfortunately, Orson's film project would later become known as Citizen Kane. Norman was that close to getting into Citizen Kane. Also some trivia, Heart of Darkness would have a loose adaptation decades later which would become Apocalypse Now. However, another big opportunity happened to Norman going into the 1940s. Get out of here! Get out of here! He's going mad! Mad! Oh, 
He would later be casted as the antagonist of the Hitchcock film Saboteur in 1942. This would be the start of his film career as well as a long friendship with Hitchcock as he began helping him later on in life. Norman also starred in another Hitchcock film, Spellbound in 1945. But I have no guilt complex. I know what I know. I killed my father and I... No, you didn't kill your father. That's a misconception that has taken hold of you. He also did some radio work throughout the 1940s, mainly in Cavalcade of America. However, the Hollywood Blacklist came into effect in 1947. For those who don't know, the Blacklist was to deny employment to industry professionals who were believed to be, or were, communists or sympathizers. A lot of Norman's friends were badly affected by this. However, Hitchcock professionally saved him. A lot happened around this time, going into the 1950s, so I'll go through this period in terms of body of work. I'll start with film. Norman starred in several films around this time, but his most notable film was in 1952 with Limelight, which he also helped choreograph. As he weeps, the spirits tell him not to grieve, his lover's not in the grave, but everywhere. Now, why is this notable? Well, it was directed, produced, written, and starring Charlie Chaplin. It also starred Buster Keaton as well. Norman met Charlie multiple times beforehand, and they even had plans to make a film together, with Norman directing and Charlie writing and producing. An adaptation of They Shoot Horses, don't they? Norman purchased the rights and had planned to cast Charlie's son Sidney and newcomer at the time Marilyn Monroe. However, when Charlie took his family to the UK for the premiere of Limelight, US Attorney General James P. McGranary revoked his re-entry permit because of the multiple communist accusations he had at the time. Hollywood Blacklist was breathing down his neck for years and got him. Just like that. Banned. Well, banned is a bit of a stretch. He was allowed re-entry on the condition that he passed a moral turpitude test, but Charlie decided not to bother. He was fed up with America at that point. Adaptation rights were not renewed, but were picked up again in the 60s, and an adaptation was eventually released in 1969, directed by Sidney Pollock to critical and commercial acclaim. Limelight seems to be the last film he starred in for quite a while, until about the late 70s. He also took some roles behind the camera. He was an associate producer, main producer, and director of several TV shows and industrial films, but the main shows he worked on was Alfred Hitchcock Presents and Alfred Hitchcock Hour. The episode I'm showing is one of the 19 he directed. This one in particular includes a younger Leslie Nielsen. Another particular show was Omnibus, with Stanley Kubrick working as second unit director in one of the episodes. He was still directing and producing into the 70s, including one episode of Columbo. His last directing slash producing credits were for Tales of the Unexpected, producing the American episodes. The series itself was created by well-renowned British novelist Roald Dahl. It was in the 80s, however, when Norman had a big comeback playing Dr. Auschlander in the TV show Saint Elsewhere. We know that someday we're gonna die. We just don't know when. His character was supposed to be killed off early in the series, but ended up being a recurring guest throughout the entire show. Norman also went on to star in the fifth highest grossing film of 1989, Dead Poets Society, playing headmaster Gail Nolan. I'm hearing rumors, John, about some unorthodox teaching methods in your classroom. I'm not saying they've had anything to do with the Dalton Boys outfit. But I don't think I have to warn you, boys his age are very impressionable. The last notable film at this time was Age of Innocence in 1993, playing Mr. Letterblair. Countess Olenska wants to sue her husband for divorce. It's been suggested she means to marry again. Nothing really notable from here on. Played some more doctors in the late 90s in The Practice and Seven Days. His last known TV appearance was in Modern Family in 2010. Remember, he was born in 1914, so he was potentially 96, but he was still going. Norman's final film role was in 2015, in Trainwreck with Amy Schumer. When it was released, he was 100 years old, and that was the first time he ever did improv. None of these bums are the equal of Babe Ruth. Norman, Babe Ruth was awful. Babe Ruth was a superhero, he was a superman. You used to be a superman when you never playing against a black guy your whole life. What has white black got to do with it? Every 12 year old kid in the Dominican Republic right now could probably beat Babe Ruth. Blah, 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 blah. We're 1947, it's one big ass blah. choice. Norman. I was the first person on my block to own a television set. That's, that's really not relevant right now, Norman. That's interesting, it's not relevant. What are robots? You coming? 
Yes, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Meryl is wearing a two-piece. The guy died three years ago. Nobody alerted him. Despite him being that age, he still would not retire. He went around doing lots of interviews from time to time regarding his life. Here's an example from the end of 2016. At the age of 102. Little Amy Schumer. Marvellous. What a mouth on her. Oh, God. <laughs> well, we were doing an improvisation and she turned to one of the actors and she said, well, fuck you. At that point in my life, I said, well, I've now heard everything. Here's an idea to show how truly old he was. Notice his accent. That's considered mid-Atlantic, something he learned at Eva Le Gallienne. You would hear that a lot in classical Hollywood films, but to adopt it and use it naturally? That's on the verge of extinction. Unfortunately, Norman would eventually die naturally in his sleep on the 11th of May 2021, at the age of 106. When it comes to centenarians, the main question that comes to mind is, what is the secret to a long life? Norman's answer was a positive attitude. Another thing he never specified as a secret to a long life, but I think it contributed, he was quite active. He was known for playing a lot of tennis, which began at the age of eight. Numerous actors he played with included Charlie Chaplin, Joseph Cotton, and Spencer Tracy. I mean, again, <laughs> this man has seen it all. Playing tennis with some of Hollywood's biggest stars, I mean, wow. He played twice a week until July of 2015, at 100, where he literally fell on his face. Even into his 100s, he was riding his bike for half an hour every day. I heard some rumours going around that he was supposed to star in some upcoming TV show called Fly, but I can't seem to find any information on it at the time I'm filming this. But if it is true, that would be his last time on screen. From a child performer all the way to his death, his career in the entertainment industry lasted a whopping 97 years. In vaudeville, theatre, film, radio, TV, pretty much every major form of entertainment throughout the 106 years he was alive. 106 years. Imagine having 100 year old memories. I can remember that part. <laughs> I compare his life to Forrest Gump in a way because, like Forrest, he was either in or around so many famous people and historical events, but Norman actually realises this. I'd also compare him to Grandpa Simpson simply because both men have a sheer amount of stories to tell. Plus, he was still willing to keep going. I think that's something we can take from this man's story, to keep going. Of course, if you have horrible back pain or have done honest work that's not particularly fun like Hugh and Cole all your life, I won't blame you for retiring, but you know what I mean. If you can, if you enjoy what you do, keep going until you drop. And with that being said, I'm out of here. All right, that does it. Get out of here, you drunk lowlife. Bless you all. Thank you, and I hope I see you next year. Hey! That's the biggest hand I've had in years. <laughs>